Thanks for tuning in to today's podcast. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our new remote training here at RPP. We've been offering remote training for quite some time, but we always required the athlete to come in-house for an assessment. Now we can do the whole assessment online and bring all of our services, pitching, hitting, and strength training to your doorstep. So if you like what we do and how we do it, go to our website at rocklandpeakperformance.com and click on remote training in the toolbar. Thanks. The Behind the Seams Podcast. I'm your host, Nunzio Signore, looking to bring you great dialogue with some of the best in the world of player development. The world of training baseball players has changed dramatically during the past few years, and I'm looking forward to shedding some light here on what's the latest, what's the best, and what's really happening in the world of player development. Thanks for joining me for the ride. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Behind the Seams Podcast. Today we're talking to Dr. Casey Pierce, and he's an orthopedic surgeon, special, surgery specialist in Wayne, New Jersey, and has over 11 years of experience in the medical field. He was born and raised in Pasadena, California, where he was a three-sport letterman at San Marino High School. After attending the United States Air Force Academy for one year, which I thought was very impressive, he obtained his BA degree from Colgate. His medical studies included one year at New York Medical College, one year at the Stedman Clinic in Vail, Colorado. He graduated from St. George's University of Medicine in 2011. Dr. Pierce completed his residency in orthopedic surgery at Seton Hall University, St. Joseph's University Medical Center, where he served as chief resident. He also completed a year's study at Dr. James Andrews' renowned fellowship at the American Sports Medicine Institute, otherwise known as ASMI, as we know it, in Birmingham. There he trained in techniques to treat cartilage, tendon, and ligament disorders of the shoulder, elbow, and knee, which we will be discussing mostly the elbow today. He is currently affiliated with medical facilities such as Cooperman Barnabas Medical Center and Hackensack Meridian Mountain Medical Center. He's also one of my go-to guys. It's very, very, it's great. I was just talking to him. It's really great when you can get a guy with this much experience uh, with my Tommy John guys and get him on the phone, go back and forth and not, not get the gopher guy and actually get the real guy. Dr. Pierce is right on with that. So we'd like to welcome to the show, Dr. Casey Pierce. And uh, for what lack of a better term, what's up, Doc? <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, man. I'm excited. Awesome, man. Um, I was just, I can't, I can't emphasize enough how, how great it is to, you know, doctors are busy guys. And I understand sometimes when you can't get back to me, but with the amount of Tommy John people that come in here to rehab that doctors send, Sometimes it's nice, you know, if I have a particular question uh, and I reach out, sometimes it's nice if the guy's available. And sometimes that's not always the case, but um, even with you, but you have a good track record of really, um, you know, showing interest in your guys and keeping in touch with their rehab. And, and I think I, kudos to you for that, because that's a really, that's a really, really good trait to have. So yeah, I think it's, that's an important part of my job is, is anytime someone's going to have surgery, it's a life changing event, whether it's. Tommy John or a toenail removal, you know, especially when you're talking about younger athletes that all they want to do is get back on the field, you know, having clear lines of communication, talking to patients, answering their questions and not rushing them. I mean, that's something that was kind of beat into me training down in the South is being respectful and upstanding, but it goes a long way to building trust, especially for someone like me who's still relatively early in their career. You know, people want to hear what I have to say and they want to feel like they have, you know, their questions answered and their concerns addressed. So you know, being in communication is as simple as picking up a phone. It goes a long way to build your reputation and, and make patients feel better, which is kind of the goal of everything. 100%. And we're, 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 you know, we're, I know that you, you know, you, you are not limited to Tommy John, TJ surgeries and orthopedic. I know you're using the new robotic techniques on the hips and, but for today, you know, my, my, my listening audience all want to know about, you know, the, uh, the smiley face on the elbow. Gotcha. So uh, the incidence of Tommy John surgery in the 15 to the 19 year old age group is increasing at an average rate of approximately 10%, 9.12% to be exact per year. What do you think are a few of the main reasons we're seeing such alarming stats in the youth population? Yeah, I think it's kind of multifactorial if you look at it. And it's kind of what we refer to in, in terms of the shoulder and elbow world as this pandemic in youth sports. I think it's multifactorial, but one of the big things we see is 
is improper. While we, we've advanced light years in terms of training regimens and accessibility to sports facilities and guys like you, where we've kind of gone backwards is, is how we treat athletes in terms of rest and proper conditioning. I, I think one of the misnomers we see is, is how their parents treat younger athletes. If, hey, if my kid doesn't pitch year round and, you know, throw 500 innings a year, they're never going to make it to the big leagues. And one of the things we've come to realize through research and experience is that kids and, and young athletes need rest. When, when I was growing up, and I'm sure the same way when you were growing up, no one played baseball year round. And certainly not in the Northeast because of the weather. Now, and we climbed trees and we ran exactly, around and we rode bikes. Exactly. You know what I mean? It, it, you didn't have these facilities where you could play year round. So no one did it. And what I did when I was, I grew up in Southern California where you could have played year round, but you know, in the, in the winter I played soccer in the spring, I played, uh, played uh, baseball and then, you know, sometimes it got in the summer, but then the fall was football or something else. Um, so you had that that period of rest. So everyone knows about pitch counts and, and not overthrowing an arm. But the other thing is that I try and stress, especially, you know, that of my sons in Little League and I'm seeing more and more young athletes is, is really two things. One is pitch counts and, and that pitchers should never play catcher, especially not on the same day. And two is the most important thing and the number one way we've seen to prevent or injuries in young athletes is they need a rest period. And that rest period needs to be continuous of at least three months. Overhead athletes need to have a three-month break from baseball. And that doesn't mean they can't hit and do some things to stay in shape and keep their skills sharp, but they should not be throwing overhead for those three months almost uniformly. So and let me ask let me ask you a question about that. What about the concept of older guys, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, um, of the concept of when, when they shut down, it's it's – it's a shutdown from throwing hard, but like light catch, maybe long oh, tossing that, out. That's fine. And that goes in the idea of think about when you were that age, like you went to the beach in the summer, you played catch with your friends. No, I, it's that strict pitching outfield, high level throws they got to get rest from. And that, that goes into the idea that there's something like a 16 or 30 fold increase of injury risk, especially in younger athletes, when they pitch or play baseball and they're tired or they're fatigued. So if, if they have another injury or they're getting worn out by the end of the year, that's where that rest period really takes away a lot of the risk of them having a severe injury or something they have to come see a guy like me, you know, for. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because <clears throat> I we we have in, in my facility, I have guys sometimes that train year round here and I have a mandatory um, what I call um, deload of October, November and December. OK, Perfect. not the pro guys, but 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 the younger guys. That October, November, and December does not mean they won't be throwing. It means they'll just be working at 50 to 60% on just drills, and they'll, they won't they will throw off a mound. And maybe 15, they'll end with 15 to 20 um, playing catch, 50% intensity, just to Davis Law, you know, just to get the tissue to, yeah. to stay residual, you know, like to, to be adaptive to the stress of throwing. That's that's more like mental preparation. That's more muscle memory and getting that throwing motion and working on mechanics. And I think that's that's good for them too. And then what I tell athletes after they have surgery is just because you had surgery doesn't mean you can't become a better baseball player while you're recovering. There's a million things you can work on that don't involve actually throwing a baseball or dribbling a basketball or catching a football that make you a better athlete and better at your sport. So that's that time period where you have to communicate that. Sometimes it's just saying it opens the eyes of mom and dad or the, the player that, look, just because you're not throwing a baseball from a mound doesn't mean you can't become a better pitcher. You can work on balance and core strength and your leg push and, and all the things that don't put your young elbow or shoulder at risk. Um, that's something they got to understand and make it part of their life. So this was one of my later questions, but since you brought it up, we'll just knock that one out. We generally start our guys, um, whoever, if it's coming from you or it's coming from Dr. Ahmad or Dr. Alchek, um, a lot of a lot of times in the post in the post op, they send them to us to get strong. Sure. And we generally start our guys as early as three to four weeks post-op on a strength training program in conjunction with their PT. We don't use that arm at all, but what we're doing is we're getting the whole rest of their body staying strong. And um, like you just said, we notice as soon as they're back to throw, like what it makes them do is it makes them take arm care and their body more serious because they can't throw now. Now they're stuck in the gym three to five days a week and they're working on their body, right? And they're getting stronger. They're giving their arm a break. They're working on mobility. They're working on arm care. All the things they may have been um, 
you know, not doing and just throwing. And when they start to throw their back to throw program, when they get to about 50 or 60%, you can see they throw, we look at the gun, we know the number we're looking for. And they look at me and they're like, wow, that felt really easy. So I noticed that not only um, not only do the Tommy the younger Tommy John guys um, come come back, they a lot of times that most of the time they come back better. It's not always the case with older, more experienced throwers, but like you said, just taking that break from throwing and working on your body, a it doesn't make them feel like an, an, a, a, a hospital patient anymore. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it keeps them athletic. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in, in my protocols, I I typically want patients to have a two to three week total rest period after surgery. And that's where right. your body has time to heal and you don't cause inflammation exactly. and basically detract from the healing surgical tissue. But after that, I, I want them doing conditioning. You know, even with the Tommy John or an elbow surgery, usually by about six weeks, I want them jogging, running, cardiovascular health, um, and certainly working on core strength, quadricep strength, glute strength, things that help make you more explosive as a baseball player are, are critical to getting them back on their feet. And also that's part of that phenomenon where we see, you know, Patients will come to my office and ask me, well, if I have a Tommy John, am I going to throw harder? And the answer is most likely yes, but that's because you're having a Tommy John at 15, 16, 17 years old, and you're going to mature and build more muscle and get stronger and perfect your technique and your drive mechanics and all the things that make you throw harder. So it's nothing I do as much as I want to take credit and market that and make a billion dollars from doing Tommy Johns. It's not me. I, I, we repair the ligament. We put the elbow back. Yes, it's stronger. But we're not affecting the muscles, the mechanics of the elbow or shoulder to make you a faster pitcher. That's the hard work that athletes put in doing their recovery and working with guys like you to, to make their, you know, perfect their technique. And, and that's why they throw harder. It has nothing to do with the surgery. A lot of these guys, <clears throat> a lot of the kids that I come that, that come in here um, that have come in with Tommy John, um, these 16 and 17-year-old kids, uh, they were generally, I when I when I talk to them and I you can even look at them and tell when when they come in, you can see that they were the most genetically developed kids at an early age. Sure. They were the they were the early to ripe, early to rot yeah. kids because the coach wants to win, and these were generally bigger guys. Um, they got thrown a lot when they were young because they were a little more durable. They were bigger. They were genetically through harder, and then the as they got older, the game caught up with them, you know, and, and now they're only 16 and 17 and they have tons of mileage on their arm. Sure. You know? Yeah, I think that's that's one of the concerns I have in my office is, you know, mom and dad bring in their 15 year old that has a full beard, you know, and is obviously past his growth spur. And they're, they're trying to tell me, you know, he's hurt his elbow, but you don't understand he throws 84 miles an hour as a sophomore. And, and it's a hard conversation to have where you don't want to kill their dreams, but you also want them to understand Look, I have an x-ray of your son or daughter's elbow. Growth plates are closed. They're not getting much taller. 84, 85, maybe the max they ever hit. And that's not going to get them a big league contract. Now, they may play Division three or two baseball, or if they got some, some good breaking stuff, they may break in with Division one program. But sometimes part of my job, which is tough, is setting realistic expectations for parents. And you can hurt feelings if you're not here. Same as me. So that's the, you know, when, I, when I talk to guys that are like scouting or trying to build a team, I tell them, look, you don't want the kid that's throwing 92 at 16 that's been doing that for a couple of years because it's like you said, he's going to have some wear and tear. And that may be his peak. What you want is the kid that still looks baby faced, maybe just has a little mustache. You know, he's not fully grown or fully developed yet and hasn't gotten that muscle coordination that comes with puberty and the growth spurt. And that makes look, you know, he throws 85, but he makes it look like he's not even trying. Plus, usually they're going to have some awkward mechanics that you can address and add a couple miles that way. You want that kid that hasn't been taxed and hasn't been overworked if you're trying to build a squad or find someone to recruit. That's the kid that's going to light it up, you know, hit the mid-90s, hit the upper 90s, and, and take off once his body catches up to his ability. Yeah, and those those are also the kids that if they are the the kid that hasn't shaved yet or really gone through puberty yet, and they're 145 pounds soaking wet and they're throwing hard, they're the guys that actually need to actually start thinking about the other side of the coin and putting on some muscle yeah. because they can't disperse that stress coming down the mound and it rattles the shoulder and it rattles the elbow and it rattles the lower back and it's 100%. like yeah, that's it's the, the Pedro Martinez, the skinny guy that throws hard. Those are the ones you worry about the torque they're putting on and you just hope that whatever genetic advantage they have to throw that hard also imparts strength to their ligaments and their shoulders. And they get good, you know, people in their ear and good mechanics. So they don't put overdue stress on a smaller body. 100%.
Can, can you talk a bit about the difference between a UCL reconstruction and a revision? Um, revision seems to get a bad rap amongst some of the doctors in much of the literature I've read. I really don't know much about a revision. So yeah, can you sure. say what that is? Yeah, what a revision, a revision indicates there's a secondary surgery. Now that doesn't necessarily have to be a re-injury with a secondary surgery. It can be things like, if you look at guys like Jake DeGrom, had a UCL injury, then had to go back and have a secondary procedure to move his nerve because it was irritated from the surgery. So revision procedures mean a second procedure on the same area. Um, when you're talking about revision surgeries where you're redoing a surgery that had failed, the big concern, especially in Tommy John, is the return to play. You know, return to play with a straight Tommy John injury for all age groups is about 85%, which isn't great. Return to play after revisions drop somewhere to like 50 to 60%. And that's because revisions throughout the board have worse returns, you know, more scar tissue. But it's also because if you think if someone has a second surgery, they're also much more likely to say, look, it's not worth it for me to do this anymore. I'm done. Or revision surgeries tend to happen in older athletes, and they may just give up on it or not make it back. So some of that data is skewed in our favor to say we shouldn't do revision procedures, but some of it also is based on age of retirement and things like that. But the, the point to make there is if you're having a secondary procedure on the same elbow, anytime you go back in, surgeons have to be very cognizant of the risk that entails. You have new surgical planes, you can damage structures that may be displaced from the prior surgery, especially if you weren't the initial surgeon. And the risk of infection and, and breaking bones or, or causing more damage goes up. So that's things you have to communicate to patients and their parents and, and not take lightly. But for overhead athletes, it's a different, it's a different problem. If, if they're not getting better and they need another surgery and they want to keep playing, keep throwing a baseball or softball, whatever it is, then, yeah, you got to take that stuff into account and make the right decision for that patient. That's like the 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 Lincecum situation. You know, we had what seven surgeries. Yeah, actually, yeah. I mean, yeah. Once you start, when you when you see that guy that's sixteen had a Tommy John when he was fourteen, now he needs another one. That's the kind of maybe we don't give him a scholarship till he gets back playing the way he used to. Yeah. Uh, you know, revision surgeries are tough. They're tough comebacks, and the only nice thing is there is some mental toughness that comes with that. Players that have gone through multiple surgeries and made a comeback tend to be a lot tougher because they've been through that and kind of you know gone to that that rock bottom into the ocean kind of situation where their their confidence is shot their body hurts and then they made the recovery now they know how to better take care of themselves and they really drive to prevent that type of problem again so they're a little smarter and wiser for it i try to i try to tell a lot of the parents that come in here the northeast the one good the one good thing about the bad thing about the northeast is the guys generally don't throw as hard as the guys down south and out west because they can play baseball all year round. They're throwing, you know. The good news about the Northeast is that they're not throwing year round, yeah. you know. So um, I I know a lot of I know a lot of college coaches that oh. you know they see a guy throwing ninety four ninety three um, from the Northeast, and they see a guy throwing ninety five from down down southern Florida. A lot of times they're going to go with the Northeast guy because they know that the mileage is just way different. Yeah, that's a real thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also too is. You know, you can get into the, the depths of like southern mechanics and vitamin D. And I think in the northeast and northwest, even the northern part of the country where you have a true winter and it's cold and dark for three or four months, guys get vitamin D deficient. So they, you know, that's when you get more prone to injury. That's when the indoor throwing becomes more dangerous. So all those things kind of go in and any, any athletes, especially in the northeast where they're going to be throwing year round. You know, in the summer, they're probably fine. They're tan. Their body's getting all the vitamin D from the sun. But in the winter time, that's when you got to start thinking about sports nutrition as well. And if you're a serious athlete and you're taking your body as as part of your, you know, your money maker someday, then then yeah, you got to get with someone who knows how to take care of everything: mind, body, arm, you know, diet, all that stuff. Love it. Um, <clears throat> UCL repair using an internal brace. This is becoming a common phrase in regard to Tommy John procedures. I mean, I have I have kids coming in that may need Tommy John, and they're asking me about what about this internal brace? Um, how long has that been in effect? And please explain what it is and why it's becoming so popular. Also, what is the difference in recovery rate between a bracing procedure and a total reconstruction? Sure. So, yeah, the, the internal brace is an idea we've actually had for years. Back in the 70s when the first uh, Tommy John was done, you know, Tommy John, the pitcher, and, and Frank Job out in, in California. You know, the initial idea behind UCLs was guys would tear them and they try and fix them. You put the, the ligament back on the bone, and those did horrible. You're talking less than a 40% return, lots of cervical complications. So we started doing these ligament reconstructions. We built a new ligament using a tendon, kind of like you would for an ACL. Well, in the last 10 years, we've kind of revisited the idea of repairing the ligament. And the way we've accomplished that is by incorporating this technique known as an internal brace. 
So to break that down, what an internal brace is, is you repair the ligament and over the top of it, we put some collagen impregnated thick piece of suture. We call it suture tape. And basically what that does is it's like putting a brace or a brace on the joint. You put it right over the top of the ligament. So it imparts that collagen into the healing ligament to give it a better surface. But it also acts like a check ring so the elbow can't break back open again and damage the ligament. Now, 10 years ago, this was like landmark stuff and we were real nervous. You know, what if we do this and it fails 10 years down the road? So it was kind of a reserve procedure. We really were selective in terms of what patients received that treatment. Um, guys have been really pushing the boundaries of that now in terms of who they do internal braces on. In my practice, the internal brace is something I, I often indicate patients for when they have partial tears of the UCL, not the fully damaged, like beat up ligament like you'd see in an older professional player. So usually a lot of that's based on x-ray and MRI findings, how I diagnose it. But every patient I do an internal brace on, I can send them to say, hey, if I get in your elbow and the ligament looks worse than it did on the MRI, I need to have your permission to do a full Tommy John because you don't want to bail out and just say I didn't do anything. So, you know, I, I probably had 99% success of doing internal braces and not needing to flip to a Tommy John, but it's they kind of go hand in hand. Now, the difference we with these internal braces and why they're catching fire is one, it's an easier surgical procedure. You're not drilling tunnels and passing grafts and doing all the things that can be a little more dangerous and technically demanding. But the other flip side of that coin is it also has a much faster recovery, or at least theoretically it does. With a Tommy John, typically you're not throwing any kind of baseball. I just mean soft toss, getting back to the throwing program for four to five months at best. With the internal braces, because we're not relying on a new ligament healing in and scarring in place, we can rapidly or aggressively increase their, their time there. So usually my internal braces are throwing by three months. And I tell them I expect them to be back pitching on a mound competitively sometime between six and seven months. Where in Tommy John, that time frame is typically 12 to 14 months. So and it's a faster good, 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 so good. it's a faster recovery. It's a little bit easier surgery, a little quicker um, surgical time and less destruction of bone. And we've seen very positive outcomes with it. The return to play after an internal brace right now is about 95%. Wow. Tommy John Classic, Tommy John is somewhere around 80, 45, like I mentioned earlier. So if we can screen athletes, do a better surgery that's less invasive and has a better return to play, man, that's a bright future. Just the concern is, is that strong enough for a major league guy throwing 100 miles an hour, you know, in his 30s if he's had it 10 years ago? And that's that's where the data right now looks very promising, but it's a little bit of a scary tactic. You're starting to talk about treating professional athletes that way. But for younger athletes, it is a no-brainer, great surgery. So that brings me to my next question. You're touching on it a little bit now. What is your checklist you go through to help you decide which method may work best for a particular athlete? In other words, how do you decide who's a good candidate for bracing as opposed to a full reconstruction? What sure. are the things you look at? I, that's good for me to know because a lot of – that's a question I get from parents. They're like, you know, they um, he might need uh, – if he needs TJ, what about this bracing? You know, And I don't really – never really know what to tell them about – um, what the qualifications for that are. Sure. Well, I mean, I, I think from your standpoint, the younger the athlete, the more likely they are they can get a, a brace. The other part becomes very technical. My first step whenever I see a kid with elbow pain is I'm going to take an x-ray. If I see any damage to the ligament on the x-ray, which is rare, meaning I see like calcium deposits or flakes of bone chipped off, those are poor candidates for, for internal brace because their tissue healing quality is poor. And they typically they need a full ligament reconstruction to remove those little pieces of bone. The other thing is the MRI. Partial tears have been the home run for, for repairs with the internal brace. Big, full tears, especially tears in the middle of the ligament, what we call mid-substance tears, those are more likely to need a full Tommy John than, than the internal brace. So my kind of algorithm is normal x-ray, partial tear on the MRI, and then youth. You know, if you've got someone that's a major league pitcher, you're still, or at least I'm still on the fence of, is an internal brace strong enough to get them back to what they want to do? I have full confidence in it. I've done kids that I think are going to pitch at the major league level. So I have very few reservations and I don't see a ton of major league baseball players. So, um, you know, I think that's the next iteration of this brace is you're going to see guys like Chris and Maude, like Dugas down in Birmingham. You're going to see them start putting these in, in professional baseball players in their 20s and have them get back faster, stronger. And as long as they don't have one failure that goes public and make them look bad, they're going to do great. And I think that's going to become the future is we're going to do as many internal braces as possible. And then it also makes it easier if they need that revision procedure that everyone dreads. If you haven't damaged the bone and drilled big tunnels and put a new ligament in, 
it does make a revision easier if you have to convert it to a Tommy John with a new injury or a re-injury. That is great information. Makes a, makes a possible revision um, easier yeah. because because of the you haven't you have not completely uh, assaulted the bone and the and the and the tissue. Um, the partial tear thing. Um, so that's the one thing I'm still a little unclear on. So what I grabbed from that was the younger the athlete, you know, the more the the more conducive they are to have a, a good chance of being successful with a brace. Um, if there's any damage to the ligament or bone chips or anything like that, that's a bad candidate for a brace. Um, a mid substance, a tear in the middle, that's a bad candidate for a brace. And the partial tear is a good candidate for a brace, but um, what are you considering the degree of a tear where it starts to get a little bit, um, you know, where's that tear, that grade tear that they talk sure. about? Yeah. What so you if you think of Tommy John injuries, the ligament has two attachments. One's on the humerus, the big bone in your upper arm, and one's on the ulna, part of your forearm bone, the kind of tip of your elbow bone. So partial tears, if you think of a ligament, it spans both of those, has connections on either side. A partial tear is if you lifted up part of it and didn't completely tear it off. So partial tears are more minimal to the, the repair because the whole ligament is still intact. It's just lifted off and needs to be placed back where it is already sitting, just no longer attached. So I think that's where the partial tear comes in. High grade partial, low grade partial, it doesn't matter to me. It's the quality of the ligament once I get in the elbow and I'm looking right at it. If that ligament looks like chewed up roast beef when I'm looking at it, yeah, I can't do a repair there. I can, but it, it's probably more destined to fail. So yeah. I think it's it's not the, the degree of partial tear. It's the quality of the tissue when I get in. I, I've had a patient or two where, you know, you saw what looked like a great ligament on their MRI, and then you get in there and you see that if I do the surgery I told them I wanted to do, they're going to do poorly. And you have to be able to make that reflex decision right there is, yep, well, my case just got an hour longer and more complex, but we got to do this. So uh, one other thing, talk, talk a bit about the concept, many high-level players, specifically these guys in the minor leagues and these retread guys who are desperately trying to, you know, they're on their last hurrah, who go ahead and get a new ligament thinking that it's going to help them throw harder. Yeah, so I think the older you are, the less likely that is to actually happen. You know, briefly I mentioned younger athletes getting Tommy John, they come back throwing harder, but that's because they got older, more experienced, better. They have they way further to go. Exactly. I, I think, you know, older athletes that get it, they're, they're the ones that are destined to fail and never make it back to pitching. If you're just getting a Tommy John to try and throw harder, man, you're in the wrong arena. But, yeah, you're, you're, but you're, that's also else. where the, the internal brace idea is amazing because guys with partial injuries that are towards into their career and can't do 14 months of rehab, you can put them back at six or eight months back into pitching, get them another contract before they, they kind of sail off into the sunset. That's a huge huge uh, breakthrough for us and, and breakthrough for pitchers that still want to get that one last shot, whether that's recreational guys just want to play catch and then go off and play with their kids or if that's a professional guy that wants to get one more shot to get out of the minors and, and get up in the show so just from an age standpoint um is there an is there a, is there a kind of a roundabout number when you're saying older guys yeah i mean once you cross about 24 25 that that tends where you fall in the older pitch category now a lot goes into that it's not just the number it's how long they've been pitching what level they've been pitching at. right 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 um and then also like i said x-ray findings if you see damage on the x-ray you're already bought the farm so and when with your with your uh with your tommy john guys how how long post-op do you generally recommend before waiting uh to prescribe the, to prescribe the back the throwing program yeah so typically my tommy johns get a throwing program around like four or five months but it, it's really it's patient dependent. You know, some guys look like they're ready faster. Other people, you got to kind of take those those kick gloves with them and let them slow down. So a lot of that goes into that is, you know, good communication with their therapist, good communication with their pitching coaches or, you know, instructors and, and seeing where they're at and when they're ready and not pushing them too fast. And some of it's mental too. I mean, some kids just aren't ready to get back sooner and you can push them later to play catch up, but it, it's knowing your patients and deciding what's right. We, we've been really, really, um, fortunate to have the trust of these of, of, of guys like you and Ahmad and and all check who send us um guys they send them out to rehab and then they send them to us um and through that we've really developed um a throwing program that we actually use um based off of ones that you know i have i have your throwing program i have Ahmad's throwing program i have all checks program throwing program i gotta be honest with you they're all basically the same throwing program yeah. it's 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 almost identical right sure. um so we are the ones who implement it 
And what happens, what, what, what happens is, is you're in the trenches with these throwing programs. So I've made tweaks that I've discussed with you before. Um, you know, the big thing, the big thing I find in the throwing programs is the percentage of perceived exertion. Okay. Um, when they, when the PT hands them a throwing program and they come in with it, I said, I want you to do me, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to ask the physical therapist, um, how do you know what 50% is, right? And like, like if you throw 90 miles an hour, you're not throwing 45 miles an hour. Yeah. So I have an actual study that I used that took 100 baseball players that throw 95, that throw 90, 85, 80, 75, and 70 when they're healthy. And they, they threw and gave us perceived exertions a hundred guys at each mile per hour. And we took the average and that is an actual, that's an actual velo. Okay. Um, like 58, they're like, they're like three mile an hour increments weekly. Um, so 50, 50% 50 might be 50, 58 to 62 for a guy who throws 85 miles an hour when he's healthy. And we use the gun. Okay, so we use the throwing program for the distance and the arc, but we use the gun to actually <clears throat> use their perceived exertion, and it works like a charm because you honestly, just because you're throwing from forty feet away, I could throw from ten feet away from a from a net and throw it a hundred percent. Sure. <laughs> right. So I think that's the the PTs. Um, that's where I that's where that's where I see the throwing programs kind of fall short a little bit because they're leaving too much of that of that decision making in a 16 year old kid who doesn't know the difference between 40 and 50 percent. You put a number on it, and it's it it seems to work a lot. Better. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I, I one thing I don't love, but I, you're kind of doing it the right way. If there is a right way, is is radar guns early on in recovery, right? Um, because you know, I think even when you're telling a kid, hey. My thought is you throw 92, 50% of your 92 should be 58 to 60 miles an hour. When they're trying to think how hard they're throwing a the ball, more goes into it, something mechanics suffer. There's a lot that can kind of mess with a ball player there. When they're under the guidance of someone who knows what they're doing, probably fine. But it's a tough thing is what is 50%, what's right. And that's where I think those arcs is I tell, I want ball players, rehab specialists, coaches, trainers to understand how a throwing program works is not percentages it's effort which is kind of the same thing but it's as you move back you increase the effort and as you come in you drop the line and increase your velocity and that's how a throwing program is designed to you know build up gradual stress on a repaired elbow or shoulder or rehabbing shoulder or elbow is it's not necessarily mile per hour or this or that it's it's how you're throwing the ball and the effort you're putting forth and we try and gauge that with those arcs and then bringing the arc down yeah, that's a that's a that's a major that's a major thing because a lot of times there are no absolutes. I mean, even when a guy gets to about sixty or sixty five percent and he goes up to seventy percent, sometimes he feels it in his arm a little bit. I'm like, listen to your arm. So you yeah. know what? Go back to sixty five percent again and do another week at sixty five percent. You know what I, I mean? That, that's a really good point. Is is you have to understand like being a surgeon, I don't see these guys throw every day. I'll see them two weeks, six weeks, three months, somewhere in there. The person that sees them do that is their coach, their trainer, their therapist. And they have to be the ones that say, look, you're not looking good at 70%. Let's drop you back so we can take it easy or even give you a couple of days off to make sure you hit the correct milestones, not only pain-free, but also with the proper mechanics that you're not putting undue stress on another part of your body that could make a new injury show up. So and that day-to-day -day view is so important. It is because I can tell you right now, Almost without fail, if a guy's going to do the throwing program, he starts at 30 percent, 35, 40 percent. I can tell you almost without fail at somewhere between that 60 and 70 percent mark, almost I'd say seven out of 10 guys arms, they have to go back to 60 percent. It's that 60, 65. It's not quite hard enough yet that it's hard, but it's the beginning of hard. And I think that sometimes the tissue needs a little bit more time at 55, 60 percent before it makes that jump. Because once they do that, they go to 70, 75, 80, 85, yeah. and it I doesn't bother. Is that, that's a mental thing for athletes is when they, you know, if you ask them the difference between 50 and 60 percent, or 50 and 70%, to them, it feels different when they're throwing. They may be just putting too much trying to hit 75% as when the 50 was more like a lob, whereas 75%, they think they got to crank it up a little. And they're just not, like you said, they're not ready. So, um, yeah, that that's a logical time. And I do see a fair amount of guys struggle at that point and have to go back for a week or two. 
So this has, <clears throat> this has been a great, great learning experience for me. I have written down about eight bullet points that I can share with athletes and coaches while they're in here doing a TJ program. Um, I got some answers. I hope the listeners have too. How can, how can they reach you if somebody needs to get a hold of you? Yeah. So my, my office of information, we can supply that to the podcast. Um, you know, what I love is when I get texts from guys like you or physical therapists, Hey, I got a kid that has some questions or thinks he has an injury. And I, I usually just have him reach out directly to my office or, or through my, my assistant Meg, who's one of my favorite people that, that kind of runs my life for me. And she, she's great with taking care of young guys and getting them in to see me quickly. So how can they reach, how do they reach that? How do yeah, they reach the, Meg? Um, Academy orthopedic is my group. We're easy to find online through Wayne. Our main office number is uh, 973-755-1400. Uh, awesome. Or I'm sorry, 755-4444. But that's that's the easiest way to get a hold of us. It's just Google our practice. You know, I got a relatively easy name because everyone thinks a Hawkeye like the guy from uh, Matt. Matt. Um, you know, we're easy to find and, and pretty well available. <clears throat> so we, we, we do make a priority in our practice of acute injuries, young athletes. We want to get them in quickly. So we'll extend office hours and do whatever is necessary to make sure you get the right treatment. And you can you can reach out to me on my Twitter account at Nunzio Signore, uh, or my facility on Twitter or Instagram at, at RPP underscore baseball. Um, our website is www.rocklandpeakperformance.com. Um, if you haven't checked out my book on velocity based training, how to apply science, technology, and data to maximize performance. That's uh, released through Human Kinetics, and it's available on Amazon. Um, I really really appreciate. Um, Dr. Pierce being here today, giving us his time and um, educating me um, as well as you on, you know, different procedures you might need to take into consideration. Um, you know, know the facts before you go, you know, you, you, you put your you put your kid on the table, really know the, know your options and get to a guy like Dr. Pierce who, you know, understands and, and, and is really on the cutting edge of what's going on. So Dr. Pierce, thanks once again. And um, all the guys from Behind the Scenes Podcast, uh, we'll see you on the next one. Love it, man. Appreciate it. Absolutely.